broadcasting? Yep. Well, good evening, Pleasant View Baptist Church friends and family, and Salem Baptist Church friends and family. Glad you guys could join us today. We're in the Epistles of Paul, and we're on part 11. Right. This is looking at the Epistle to the Church at Philippi, uh, the Philippians. You guys are somewhat familiar with that tonight. We're going to jump straight into this. Hopefully keep us under an hour and cover as much as we can in the time. If you have your books, uh, it's pretty much the same content. I did add a few things, so if you're looking at your books, you can't find a few verses here and there because I decided to add a few things in the process. Let's start off tonight with the background of Philippians. I like to start off these little books with just seeing where we are, who wrote it, when it was written, and some of that context. So I will I ask Jerry to read that first All slide right. out the gates. All right. Philippi was a Roman colony, according to Acts 16.12. The emperor Augustus allowed retired soldiers to live there after they had supported him in battle in a battle in 31 BC. As a Roman colony, its citizens possessed the same rights and laws as those who lived in Italy. It's good to know. It's good to know. Being a Roman citizen had its advantages back in those days. Definitely. Paul and Silas, with Timothy and Luke, established the church there after they crossed the from Asia into Europe. Acts 16. All right. And I'm going to read a portion of Acts chapter 16, just a, just a second or two here. You can see the map where uh, Philippi sits. It's not in Asia Minor. It's just right across, right across the way there into Europe, right. the far eastern edge of Europe that you find Philippi. So that's when they had the Macedonian call in the beginning of Acts chapter 16. Paul goes over, and the first place he stops and settles to plant a church is in Philippi. And I'm going to read that text tonight and have Cameron read all the texts from uh, Philippians. So Acts chapter 16, verse 11 through 15. So, setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia. Now, Macedonia is a place there in, in ancient Greece. It's a region of territory, and Philippi is a city there. And, so I'll read that last part, a city of the district of Macedonia, and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we'll, I'll pause here before I finish up that sentence here. And the reason they're going outside of the city of Philippi on the Sabbath day is because there is no synagogue in the city of Philippi. Right. You know, you must have 10 adult men to establish a synagogue, which means there is such a small Jewish population. There are fewer than 10 Jewish men in Philippi. Otherwise, there would have been a synagogue somewhere in the city of Philippi. Wow. So they go outside uh, to create a place of prayer on the Sabbath. Since there's no synagogue, they can gather and assemble uh, outside in, in a place of worship. Okay, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. Indication, again, there's no Jewish men in the town, enough observant Jews to get a synagogue together. And one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to, to pay attention. I want to, before I get to that sentence there, if you look at the, if you look at the map, you can see Thyatira is on the other side. It's on the far western side of Asia Minor. It's on the, it's on the Asian continent on the far eastern side there. So she is the first convent listed by name on European soil was a woman from Asia. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of neat, isn't it? God mm -hmm. doesn't care. I mean, there's no respecter of persons anyway. Right, right. You have a lady from Asia, which we consider this the uh, Middle uh, Middle East or Asia Minor, maybe. This is Turkey today, right? That's right. That's Turkey. And that's right. So so thank you for saying that. Sometimes I forget because these, these places don't go by the modern names. But if you can find Turkey in the map, it kind of straddles two continents, Asia right. and Europe. This lady from Asia crosses over. Uh, the sea there and goes into Philippi on European soil and there she hears the gospel preached and she becomes a convert to Christianity. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And, and you mentioned in your mm -hmm. conversion story how you sat in church many, many times as a boy and it was one day God opened your heart to hear. Right. You heard the same kind of gospel presentation right? and just one day you heard this and it wasn't because it was a particularly good sermon, though it may have been an exceptional sermon, because you don't remember the content. But God opened your heart. Right. And you was able to respond to the gospel only after God first worked in you to open your heart. That's right. interesting how the, the mystery of the gospel seed is planted. is The soil must be tilled with the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. who opened the heart. Amen. 
And after she was baptized, this is verse 15 of 1 Corinthians, excuse me, verse 15 of Acts chapter 16. And after she was baptized and her household as well, meaning that they all came to faith, they weren't baptizing people who didn't believe or right. resisting somehow. They all heard, they all came to faith, maybe children, maybe her husband, you know, I believe it's believer's baptism, people who could, right. you know, credo baptism and knew and understood a confession of faith. Uh, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So I like how she just, uh, she pers she insisted, she persisted into saying, if you, if, if, if you think I'm a true born again believer, please let me, please let me be the hostess right. and bring you in. But of course, Paul, and we know Paul and Timothy are on this trip. They're not from Philippi, so their best options are to stay with someone that they've just met. Right. In this case, it's a brand new Christian lady and her household. We don't know who's in the household, but we know that they come to Christ in faith and been baptized. Is that the Nile River? Uh, that's the, that's right. That's the start of the Nile River. That's exactly right. That's the all old, the tributaries. The old Delta. Mm -hmm. And from there, the water goes in and moves south in, into the Nile. Okay. I think it's where it starts, yeah. Well, Jerry, have you continued the commentary here? Yeah, Paul visited uh, Philippi again on his third missionary journey. You read that in Acts 20, 1 through 6. It was a group of Christians of whom Paul was very fond. He called its members his joy and crown. The Christians in Philippi were not rich, but they supported Paul with more than one gift of money. With, yeah. They also gave money for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. 2 right. Corinthians uh, 8, 1 through 5. All right. And so we'll get to the first question here. You see a picture of the amphitheater still stands there in Philippi. The city was abandoned in the 14th century after mm -hmm. Ottoman or the Muslim conquest. So it, it, it was still in place there for many, many years. Let's move on now to the purpose of the letter. And I promise him you'll get a chance to read, to read all the text tonight from <laughs> Philipp Philippians. I can promise you'll get to that. So here's a little bit of context. And I'll pick up this while Jerry's drinking. The epistle to the Philippians is the last of the four prison epistles of Paul. This letter was not written for one single purpose. Paul had a number of reasons for writing. Here's some reasons for, that Paul wrote this letter. And I think these are in your book if right. you want to follow along. He wanted to update the church about his situation and where, what's going on with his life. He wanted to thank them for the, a gift they had sent. He wanted to give them information about Epaphroditus. Easy for me to say. <laughs> he wanted to warn them about false teachers and encourage them to remain steadfast in the truth. He wanted to encourage unity in the church. He wanted to exhort them to rejoice. In fact, that's a the theme of Philippians is to rejoice. And the last reason for writing this letter to the church of Philippi was, most of all, however, he wrote to them because they had a deep care and effect. He had deep care and affection for them. So we do see some personal remarks. He knew this church. He planted this church. And when he finds himself in prison somewhere, he stops. He takes the time to write back to some of those churches that he visited. Uh, most likely, Paul wrote many, many more letters than we have canonized. Right. It would just be safe to assume he wrote a lot of letters that never were, were made into the canon, but that's perfect. It's fine with me because the Holy Spirit who preserved the text gave us what he thought we should know. Right. And what we have is certainly adequate and sufficient for instructing us in righteousness' sake, Amen. reproving, correcting, all those kind of things. We have enough of God's revealed word. And maybe, who knows, we get to heaven one day, we meet some of these churches that Paul planted we never knew about, and they'll get a chance to share some Paul stories. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sentimentalizing it a little bit. I don't know if that'll ever happen to heaven. It'd be kind of cool if it would. It would. All right, so we've looked at the city of Philippi, right. the church. We've looked at the author of the letter, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the purpose of the letter. Now the author. Now, Cameron, you're out. Here you go. Philippians 1 and 1. 1 and 2. Okay. Paul, <clears throat> Philippians 1, 1 and 2. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers, pastors, and deacons, Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, we'll pause right there before we get to the first question. <laughs> first two letters, the opening uh, address of Paul to the Church of Philippi, it always starts off saying who he is. Right. always starts off by saying who he's writing to. In this case, it's Paul and Timothy. They knew right. The church knew both of these guys because they were in you read Acts 16. It's these two men that went and planted the church in Philippi. Yeah. In fact, when we wrote letters, we signed who wrote it at the end of the letter. Ah. But here... In the, 
Paul's day, they put it right at the beginning. That makes more sense. You know who the letter's from. Yeah, I like it. Right out the gates, you know who this is. And when you write a formal letter, even nowadays, I guess you address who you're writing to. In the memo line, you're writing, you know, maybe you're writing what you're writing about in the subject line. Right. But yeah, you're right. I think even in today's, well, if there's a letterhead that's different. If you got right. a letterhead, a letterhead it tells you all that information. But normally in our letters, we get to the bottom of this and we figure, oh, that's who wrote it. But I guess if it's being mailed in an envelope, as you get the envelope, you're going to see, see who it's from. So. Well, these weren't in envelopes. Uh, these were just <laughs> rolled in, uh, or they were parchments. They weren't necessarily scrolls. They were just uh, paper, but they were probably written two sides. Right. That's what we're looking at here. Who wrote the letter? Paul, Paul. Timothy. All right. Well, Paul is the author probably of this, but he's with Timothy. There's no question. This is a Pauline epistle. This is no right. doubt that. Paul wrote this letter. No question, no no scholarship says what otherwise. About Timothy? Does he count? Well, that's a nice question. What he was didn't Timothy? Write it, but he was there. Right. What was Timothy's role in this well, letter? I'll say this. It says that they're servants of Christ Jesus, so I don't know if that's what you're looking for as their role. But I think Timothy was learning from Paul. It's, which one of the two was he? Well, we know that Timothy was a convert led to Christ by Paul. Had a uh, Jewish mother, Greek mother, Jewish father, right. one or the other. I forgot how that worked out. Jewish mother, well, Greek father. Jewish servants, mother, Greek father. Servants of Christ Jesus. They're servants. And Paul, uh, excuse me, Timothy did relay letters back and forth. He, did, he was a courier. Right. He, did, he did leave Paul's side and would mail, take the letters. There was no, this is back in the days before there was a postal service. You didn't put a stamp on a letter, put it in your mailbox, and they come by and pick it up for you. You had to literally have someone hand carry, or carry this by hand, by horse, by, by boat, uh, deliver it. To a person wherever they were, right. a very cumbersome way of getting mail out, but it was it worked. It was efficient, yeah. obviously. But that's one of the roles that Timothy has. He he is the courier. He is the carrier of this letter. Now he's with Paul in his trials. Um, so who wrote the letter? Paul. No question about that. What's Timothy's role? Well, he's a servant with Paul. He's not writing this letter, but he's probably carrying this letter. Who's the letter addressed to? God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, or in other words, Christians in Philippi. That's right. right. And this is something we often don't think spend much time thinking about this, but this letter is not written to you or to me. Right. It is written to the people at Philippi. So we need to put that in perspective. That's right. They it might be addressed about their particular issues that won't apply to us necessarily. But obviously the epistles of God through the Holy Spirit did have Paul write this for us, but not to us. So there are certainly truths we need to glean from these epistles. But I think it's important we say who is it written to because that makes a big difference. Is it, it makes us the difference in knowing who is in that church, what the controversies are, who the people right. are. Those are important details. And that goes a long way into interpreting the letter properly. Because yes. If it was written to somebody specifically, there was a reason why Paul wrote it. And so the reason why Paul wrote to the Philippians, whatever he had to say to them, whatever was going on to them, that's what we need to hear. We that's need nice. the principle there applied to today. So if, it, if you don't look at it contextually, then you can just make it mean whatever you want to mean. Right, and people often do. Yeah, yeah, that hardly ever happens. Well, so here's Lydia, right? So we got to assume Lydia's in her house. Unless the church has grown in the time he writes this letter, it's probably still meeting her her house. Right. There are no synagogues, uh, right? We know that. So it's almost an entirely exclusive uh, Gentile church, mm -hmm. um, with the exception of a handful of people. It becomes a Gentile church because the population of town would, support, would sustain that. And it's meeting at home. There's no building on the corner. Right. It's still in someone's house. Philippians 1, 12 through 13, Cameron. Paul's change, of, Paul's change advanced the gospel. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that, what's hap what, that what has happened to me actually served to advance the gospel. <clears throat> As a result, I, it has become clear throughout the whole place, guard, palace guard, and to everyone else that I'm changed for Christ. In chains for Christ. Yeah, you're going kind of fast. What, how, how did the chains or the Roman imprisonment, this is, a, this is a prison epistle, which means that Paul was in prison when he's writing this. He wrote right. four. It's the last of those. How did Paul being in chains advance the, the gospel? In fact, if you'll go back to this, and um, he says here, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. Jerry, what do you think that means? How did, how is his well, being imprisoned to help spread the gospel? Well, first of all, it gave him time to write this letter, to, which has spread the gospel far beyond anything Paul could have imagined. Secondly, uh, everybody knew, everybody that, where, where he was imprisoned, they knew why he was imprisoned. It was for Jesus. So Paul wasn't 
protesting his innocence or or you know throwing his food up against the wall on a, on a starvation strike or whatever paul was preaching christ all right and he was guilty as charged he was guilty of being a christian yeah. and guilty of, of, of inadvertently causing trouble every time he went because he <laughs> right. kept preaching christ being faithful to his his lord and savior right. so that's good that, that's the two reasons why cameron first the first way he advanced the letter the gospel is by writing these letters he, if he was not in prison he would not have written this letter. Yeah. He, was, he had to stop, be stopped to do that. And then secondly, uh, in, in more direct, immediate way, he right. preached to everyone around him. Even in, in, the, in the prison here at Philippi, we know that he, he's chained and he's, he's preaching and singing and those all sorts of things. I think you can see, as far as a principle, from what we've looked at so far on this slide, is that you know sometimes delays are divinely ordained. There's mm -hmm. a reason. You may not understand it at the time, but certainly Paul's imprisonment yeah. was used by God in order for Paul to write this gospel and to preach the gospel to the people that were there. But the Philippian jailer and his household right. were yeah, converted. Uh, not in this, because he was in Philippi when he was arrested, but it's an example of Paul leading people to Christ even in the jail. And then there's the third way, because it says right here, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guards that to everyone else that I'm in exchange for Christ. So you can see that everyone sees that it's clear he's in chains for Christ, so they're like, oh, he's in chains for Christ. He's willing to do all that. He's suffering for God and for us, so that way we can have that. And he's suffering for God. He must really, he must really think that this is such a really true thing. Maybe we should actually think into this. That's right. I think, I think that, I he think inspired them. The persecution of the saints has furthered the gospel yes, in cultures where it is, because it does show the sincerity of belief. Uh, many Christians today, sadly, won't even go to church, let alone being put in prison for right. going to church. Right. So right. Okay, what's it? What's incentive for me? Well. Obviously, Paul advanced the gospel even in his chains. And we'll continue on here. Philippians 1, 21 through 24. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm going to go on and living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. All right, and I like that Paul said this because yes. I get I, I'm developing my intermediate state theology based upon this this verse here. Amen. What I mean is that the state between my death and the resurrection, if it wasn't for this verse, I might be convinced of another another position on this. But I think this right. single verse helps me know what happens in this this intermediate state. Right. Mm. And. Um, Let's answer the question, then we'll elaborate on what, why, how, why I think this is so important. What was Paul's struggle? What was his struggle here? Well, because he wants to die and go to heaven, because that's a gain. That's a really good thing. But he has to stay on this earth because it was necessary for Paul to remain alive, because he needs to spread the word so that more Christians can sprout, and more people can go to heaven. And that should be our struggle, too. Right. I, Amen. It, we're, we're to hold this world loosely, mm -hmm. right? Hold it so loose that if God yanks us out of here, we don't. If every <laughs> we Christian, can let go of this world, in other words. Right. If every Christian died and killed himself after they found salvation, then there would be no Christianity. Yeah, we're not called to commit suicide, but we're yeah. called to hold we're the world loosely this. in the sense that we're holding on, but not so tight we can't leave this place. Exactly. Right. That yeah. ought to be all of our tension we face in this life. Right. Boy, I've got cancer, and the best thing that happened to me is not to be healed in this life, but to die. Mm. Right? Because mm -hmm. the best thing that happened to me if I get cancer today is not to suffer and everybody overcome it in this life. But that'd be right. kind of cool in some ways. The best thing that happened to me is to die in the presence of God. Yeah, and that's, that's Paul says it's far better. That's the best. That's the ultimate uh, destination for Christians. That's where we're heading. Well, I mentioned a second ago, and this is not in the study, so I'll just pick it up here. I think this is a very important verse in helping develop your doctrine of the intermediate state. Right. When you die, you don't experience psychopanachia or soul sleep. You don't lay in the ground like the Seventh-day Adventists no, teach. The heaven or hell. Right. The Seventh-day Adventists teach that you go and you, you lay asleep until there's a resurrection. Right. And the Church of Rome says that, no, no, it, there's situations where you might die but not go to heaven. You might be in the purgatory right. waiting for it to be prayed out or bought out or right. rented out or whatever happens there. But you still go to heaven. Well, this verse plainly teaches... Uh, and this is what Paul says plainly. He could be any more Amen. plain than he is. When he when he dies and his body's ejected, his, his soul is ejected from the material, physical state that he's in now, uh, he he's going to be in the presence of God. 
Amen. Now we can we can take other verses of scripture and the same subject and form a better doctrine, a more complete doctrine, is that when you die, you wait the resurrection. Uh, I can infer from this text that I'm present, I'm conscious, I'm alive, I'm with Christ, and I'm worshiping right. around the throne. Uh, right. In fact, it says in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 6, those those beheaded souls around the altar. And then you see again in Roman cha uh, Revelation chapter 16, the souls under the altar. Again, they're souls who have yet to receive a glorified, resurrected right. body. Right. And so we can infer from other places of Scripture, uh, along with this verse here, that when you die, you go in the presence of God, where you remain, and you remain in that state until the resurrection, in which you get a material, physical body, supernatural body to, to, to stay in for eternity. Right. Amen. The struggle of the church at Philippi. All right, Cameron, Philippians yeah. 1, 29 through 30. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you since you are going through the, through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Okay. So they, they're struggling just because Paul left town doesn't mean that they sort of let up on Paul. Right. Um, he caused enough trouble in town through the preaching of the gospel that even his converts who stayed afterwards faced the same kind of persecutions. I think it was in Philippi we had a lady who was pestering them, I think, who was, uh, these are the prophets of God and the men of God. That was in Philippi that story happened. It was in Philippi where Paul was in prison, and that's where the Philippian jailer who becomes part of the of the Bible history, right? right. He's he's in, he becomes a, a a believer in Christ. Just because Paul left does not mean that all of a sudden the, the church, the people in Philippi, is like, well, now that he's gone, we can accept Christianity. They kept on hating just as it was, even though Paul was long out of town. Right. So Paul knows their struggle. Well, question four: What kind of struggle was the church at Philippi experiencing? What kind of trouble? suffering were they going through you have to read the book of acts to get a better well, picture of this. first first of all they weren't even completely in christianity so what do you that's mean by one that? struggle well because most of them weren't even christians how about the church at philippi oh what was the struggle with oh, the church at philippi? So we're philippi about the, itself yeah, okay. just the church so, okay they only believe in christ but not suffer for him so they think that they can only just believe in christ and not like okay that's what it's. I don't think that's it, though. Yeah, they they were struggling. He said, it's "Since not you because are going through the believe... same struggle that you saw that I had, they were the same kind of that's struggle." That's not the struggle. That that's not it, though. Well, yeah, it's past tense. You that Paul's saying well, you, what you was saw the struggle, though. I All right, Jerry, take a step. That was persecution. I mean, we're talking about because I thought it was that, but that doesn't. That's what that. Paul's going through. Yeah, and that's what they're going through. And it's interesting how Paul responds to this because. You know, today we, we would, you know, a lot of us would try to, you know, to get people to avoid that. You know, you're suffering persecution. That's not right. Right. You know, Paul says this is going to happen. This is the way it is. You should have an easier road than that. Right. Oh. Is it frozen up there? Is it? Frozen. Oh, and now it shows the church. I don't know. I just, I'm putting it up there. Don't worry. I'm loading up there. That's right. So we are struggling. I mean, it's it should not be a surprise to us that we struggle. Uh, though nobody likes to struggle, it shouldn't be a surprise. Cameron's cheesing for the camera there. <laughs> like how Paul frames it, it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe, but also to suffer. Like, granted to you to suffer. Mm -hmm. Oh, what a joy. Yeah. It's the background was on a map. Going to zip through this thing here. Nile River. <laughs> That's Italy. Oh. <coughs> All right, so let's move on here to the struggle of the Wait, church. Dad, can we go back to the last question? Yeah, absolutely. I thought, here, go back up. I thought that this was a, a, where is it? Are we on the right slide? This is the slide. That's the question, it's a previous slide. Oh, okay. Wait, I'm sorry. We were a little further on. I'm sorry. Yeah, that slide. one, that one, that one. Um, this slide, I thought for at first I was mentioning that, but then I read that and I was like, you don't intentionally suffer for Christ. Yeah. So that wasn't it. Yeah, Paul said it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not just to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. So there, like you just said a moment ago, God, Christ gave him the privilege of believing and also the privilege of oh, suffering for him. It comes with the I territory. It's, I mean, you don't want to suffer. You don't want to see your, your family suffer. You don't want to see Christians beheaded on a beach by... You know, some radical group, or 
uh, you don't want to see your own children you know, come to Christ and then uh, end up suffering for Christ on a mission field. I mean, nobody wants to see anybody suffer. That's right. But it is it comes with the territory. And this whole gospel that is preached is not a gospel about avoiding this kind of suffering. It you know flies in the face of clear biblical truth. Right. So Paul's struggle was suffering, but they don't have to su su suffer. Well, if you live in Philippi, so you, had not... to you had to suffer. If you uh, live there, you had to suffer because that's part of the experience of being a Christian in Philippi in the first century. Paul's form of struggling was suffering, and so there's, he's saying that they were also suffering. Yes, um, and just because he left town and was no longer in Philippi, the city of Philippi, that pe those people stayed back in that church, they kept suffering like he did. Yeah. Uh, they stayed because that was their home. That was their hometown. And they faced, in some ways, maybe worse than Paul because Paul could leave town. Right. Um, yeah. But as Roman citizens, you'd hope that they would be, they wouldn't, they could face, they could escape some of that. Right. Yeah. And one more thing, and we do need to move on. I know. Um, sometimes when you're suffering as a Christian, you think something might be wrong. And you need to hear what Paul told them that, you know, you're going through the same struggle I had. So it's not uncommon, it's common. So you're not, there's nothing wrong. You're, you know, you're being blessed in, yeah. in a way of speaking. Count it all a joy, right? You should, right. We, we don't want to think of that, but Paul right. says Christ gave you the power to believe. He also granted you the ability to suffer. Right. He granted you this wonderful opportunity to suffer. Yeah. What a backwards way of thinking about this. Mm -hmm. Let's move on now to look at the, the Carmen <laughs> Christi, which is the hymn to Christ. Now, I'll say this, we're going to look at the context of this and read the hymn. I preached a couple months back, I said, I'm going to preach on, from the hymn books today. And they said, what do you mean the hymn books? You know, Brogman hymnal? Which, which hymn? I said, no, no, the hymn book inside of the hymn inside of the hymn book, or Bible, which is Philippians 2, 6 through 11. There's a lot of truth in this. Now, Paul is not uh, making this up, uh, nor is it fresh revelation from the Holy Spirit. He's quoting an earlier source. I do think it's divinely inspired. It's a hymn of the earlier church. It's been around since the very, fir very first few moments of Christianity. This ancient Carmen Christi, this ancient hymn they were familiar with. So I don't know the tune to this song, <laughs> but we'll at least read the Does lyrics. Does anyone know the tune of it? Probably not, no. So here's uh, some context. And we can alternate verses, uh, slides yeah, if you don't mind. Sure. Philippians 2, 6 through 11. This is the Carmen Christi, the hymn to Christ. Also known as the, kin the Kenosis hymn because we're going to see the word made empty here, was utilized by the early Christian church to teach and magnify the pre-existence, incarnation, and the full deity of the Son of Jesus Christ. Mm. Context of Philippians 2 is clear. Paul stresses to the Philippians that they ought to act in a harmonious and humble way. Paul then instructs them to have an attitude in themselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, humility. Right. Which, th which then leads to Paul in verse 6, to present to the ultimate act of humility, Christ, who was always substituting as God, emptied himself, taking the form slash nature of bond of servant, and becoming obedient to the point of death. All right. Christ always subsisted as God. Right. But he empties himself, the kenosis, the emptying of himself, to become something he had not. Hmm. In these seven short verses, this is the hymn we're going to be saying, Paul provides a beautiful delineation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This hymn to Christ as God systematically encapsulates Jesus' nature as subsisting as God, which means pre-existing, right. his incarnation, his cross work, mm -hmm. his exaltation, and his distinction from God the Father whom he glorifies. Mm. Unquestionably, Paul positively affirmed the two-natured person of the Son implicitly and explicitly in virtually every one of his epistles. You can see those on the screen. Right. And many, uh, some scholars, I'm not sure, I mean, you can say many, I don't know if you can say most, but many scholars believe that this Carmen Christi hymn dates back within the first few years of Christianity. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly Paul quoting an earlier source. Now here's that, Car here's that hymn, Cameron, the Carmen Christi, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Oh, you added something. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature to God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. 
Rather, he made himself nothing, taken by the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him... Oh, I thought I said... And gave him the name that is above every name. And gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Christ Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. And that is the song. If you need the tune, I have you sing it. <laughs> oh. Uh, oh, I should have sang like a song. Dang it. Here. But that's okay. We don't know the tune, but let's just move on here. It was... We I got missed through. a good opportunity. That's okay. What did the early church, based on this hymn, understand about Jesus? We're going to roll back here and answer them this question. The basics. Well, yeah, the basics and advanced theology. So, yeah, that's an interesting point. The basics ought to be more advanced than they are, but these are some. This is good. So, let's start with verse six. This is where the song starts. You right. can see in the text right there. In the very nature God, mm -hmm. which would mean He's eternal, He's omnipotent, uh, He's omniscient, yeah. He's omnipresent. He's all those omni words. The very nature of Christ is the nature of God. He shares it with God. But more impressive than that as he enters this humbled state, doesn't consider himself equal with God. Why? Because he's taken upon himself a lower state. Right. Now, we're Trinitarians, and there's two ways that word is used. The um, ontological trinity, which describes the essence of who if, of each being. They're both, they're all eternal in the same, you know, the same substance. Uh, they're all, uh, they're all, uh, all powerful on the present all those divine names ontologically describe the Trinity. But the second way we use the word Trinity is the economic Trinity, mm -hmm. which means there are roles of distinction. Christ is not God the Father. Mm -hmm. But in this role of the Son, the position he takes on the R-O-L-E, this position he takes on of the Son, he humbles himself and becomes less. Does he consider himself equal with God? Now, this ought to be the death knell in the modalist position. Yes. Because if he were God the Father, he would consider himself equal with God. <laughs> right. But the whole passage of the Carmen Christi that Paul's using here is this, that in this humbled state, took upon himself a human nature, uh, being less, less than the angels, becoming like a man, he is not equal with God the Father, which right. means he sees himself as not being the same as God the Father. Does that make some sense? Mm -hmm. Now, this is, that's... That's profound stuff, and that's what Paul would have us understand here. Yeah. Not equal with God, something to be used to his own advantage. Right. Now, this is the emptying phrase. This is the kenosis word, the nothing, the emptying of self here. Uh, rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Mm -hmm. This is a direct reference to the incarnation. Now, in the incarnation, Christ does not lose his divine nature. Right. He simply adds a human nature. It's subtraction by addition. <laughs> Meaning he makes himself less than the Father, not by taking away his divine attributes, right. but by adding to it a human nature. Right. Now that'll preach, <laughs> man, Jay. Wow. Know, it's subtraction man. by addition. That just, show, that just shows how little we are. It's like yeah. adding negative numbers. Right. <laughs> That's right. It's adding negative numbers. Uh, now, a human nature... It, implies a lot of things right it implies the ability to sin it implies the ability to uh ability to, to be fallen to pick up on yourself sin um all the frailties that come with being human all those things are entailed in being human right right although in his state of the incarnation in christ's ministry of three and a half years his earthly existence of 33 years or however long he was on earth he was more like adam than he was us right like right. us, minus the, the original sin, minus exactly. the, the taint of the sin of Adam, he didn't have that. Now, could he have sinned? In a sense, in the human state, he could have. Right. right of Hebrews says, he was tempted in all points as we are, right. yet without sin. You can't be tempted to sin if you can't sin. Right. And Just like Adam succumbed to temptation, uh, he could have. However, he's better than the first Adam. Right. Christ, as Paul says in Romans, is the second Adam. Where Adam, the first Adam drops the ball on the two-yard line, right. the second Adam will to score a touchdown. Right. He will not fumble and, and become right. sinful. So in one sense, and it's true, Christ could be tempted to sin, but God didn't send Christ to this earth 
you know, not knowing the outcome. There was no way Christ was going to fail. This right. was a win-win as far as God's redemptive plan. And another point is, you know, this early hymn kind of shatters the, the theory that holds some, that some hold that, you know, it's kind of ev evolutionary res religious historical understanding of, of religion is that we go from the simple to the complex. Here this hymn shows that the early church from the get-go had some serious understanding of their theology. Amen. And people say that, you know, well, the doctrine of the Trinity was really hammered out, you know, three, four hundred years later and all this kind of stuff. It was there all the time. Yes. And, and this hymn proves that the church had a deep theological understanding of the nature of Christ. Yeah, it, it was. This, this is as close to a creed as we get. Right. And this is a very tight creed. It's in the form of a hymn. That's exactly Amen. right. And, and we're going to keep unpacking this a little bit here. And being found in the appearance as a man... He humbled himself by becoming obedient to, the, uh, to death, even death on the cross. Why the incarnation? Because you can't nail God to a cross. Right. John chapter 4, Jesus says to the woman in the well in Sychar, Samaria, God is spirit, right. and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. You can't nail the spirit to a cross. The, the, the incarnation, the, the human nature and human body added to Christ at the point of conception Right. In the womb of Mary was for the purpose of nailing him to a cross. Right. A man dying for men. A human dying for humanity. That's right. Uh, more than being a man, he was the God man. That's right. right. He was a divine man because God, uh, God can't die. God can't be nailed to a cross. Right. That's, that's why we must have the, uh, the incarnation. So now we've got him nailed to a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name of the river name. Now, notice the distinction here. God exalted who? Jesus. Jesus. Not the same person, right. but two separate persons. Right. God exalts, does something to who? Does something to Jesus. Right. If he, Now, people say, now that we looked at this some last week when we looked at St. Patrick's Day. We touched upon the Trinity there. Uh, it's a very important doctrine because it's a biblical doctrine. Right. I saw recently where somebody was preaching and said, God is like water. He exists in three states. He's a solid. He's a liquid. He's a gas. But he's always just water. <laughs> well, no, that's modalism. Right. That's God existing in three separate modes or three separate trans right. uh, substances or two separate things. Um, God is not three separate things. Because here we see in verse 9, God the Father, right, exalted Jesus to separate persons and gave him something, the name above every name. And uh, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, heaven and earth, and every tongue acknowledges is Christ to what? The Lord, the Lord. God the Father. Right. Very good. God the Father, God the Son. And it's right, through the Holy Spirit that a man is led to even worship right. in the first place. Right. So my thunder, Derek. <laughs> So when I ask the question, what the early church understand about Jesus? Well, more mm. than we give them credit for. Yeah. They have a pretty developed doctrine of the nature mm, of God. Not just the basics. Yeah. Within the first three years of Christianity, we have a pretty well yeah. hammered out theology based upon. Now, this hymn, I think, is divine. It has to be divinely it has inspired. Because yeah. Paul treats it like it's divinely inspired. Even if he's quoting it, he right. still quotes it as divinely inspired. Right. You can build a Christological theology, pretty good one on this hymn. Amen. Which, if it's not divinely inspired, it ought to be, right? <laughs> well, that's right. Yeah, well, that's right. Well, Paul treats it as such. I believe it to be. Um, but yeah. sadly enough, you can't say that for a lot of hymns in your hymn book. No, no. And many of the hymns that we sing have nothing more than sentimental of value to us. Right, exactly. We like them because we always sing them. Or they make us feel good. Yeah. But a lot, many of the hymns that we sing now, I'll say this, there's an effort in... Baptist hymn books to have a committee at least approves the songs that make in the hymn book. They should at least have somewhat of a doctor of theology behind them, right? Should yes. be sound in some degree. But we could probably search and find one or two that don't quite measure up oh, to. Oh, I'm sure you could. For whatever reason. You but, know, what you, what's the use of a hymn if it doesn't reinforce biblical truth? That's right. That's, uh, uh, that's the primary purpose of a hymn is to let us put to musical form right. God's word so we worship. Right. Correctly. Yeah, I mean, hymns get stuck in your music gets stuck in your head all the time, and if your hymns that are that you're singing throughout the day uh, aren't theologically sound, then, then really, what have you remembered? Right. No, no better than a secular song. Right. Got it.
I know a song that we sing quite often is literally a verse. Just re it's like. Oh, go for it. Which one do we sing? I, I forget what it's called. We haven't sang it in a while, but we used to sing it a lot more than we do now. It's it's a straight up verse. It's just put in a song form. Yeah, I think the doxology is that we sing that song. I'm trying to think of some other songs that we sing. Um, oh, I like Rock of Ages. Clap for me. Yeah, that's based on biblical truth. Christ is the Rock of Ages. He's the Rock that Moses struck. In right. typology, that's a good one. Uh, but but there right there are some songs that we sing that are literally just transposed right. verses, right. which is awesome. We put those. To, yeah. right. And some churches sing only the hymn or the Psalms. There are some churches that just do strictly Psalms from the Bible, and don't see any other form of of uh, hymn or singing in church uh, legitimate. That's not us. No, I, uh, not but we do sing, I think, some good hymns that are right. certainly are grounded in the Word of God. Yeah. Philippians 2, 7. Let's read this one more time. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made into human likeliness. You, you mentioned how little this is of us. Yeah. In comparison to God, that's true. Yeah. And the word here is nothing. He made himself like us, which is like, which is nothing. <laughs> it's like this. God is so high that he would add us on to another sort of God-like figure and it would drop him below God. Yeah, that's the incarnation to some degree. That's right. You know, uh, I've heard Jeremy make this quote, and he's quoting, I think, Paul Washer, and he says this, which is more like God? Which is more like God? And I'm, I'm quoting Jeremy, who's quoting Paul, Paul Washer, and it's, it's this. It is it the bacteria in a toilet or a person? Which is more like God? Hmm. Well, and your, your, your first impulse say, well, like we are. We're, we yeah. can think. We can yeah. rational. We have decisions to do things. With. And the answer is neither. <laughs> we're, so, yeah. we're so unlike God, right. we're closer to the bacteria <laughs> toilet than it's we like, are God. It's like you see two germs. It's like, which one is larger? Well, neither. They're both so tiny. And they're right. both so similar, tiny in size that I can't tell. Yeah. They're practically on the same level. That's right. And we're we're no different than the germ as mm. far as in comparison to we God. We think right, right. that, oh my gosh, obviously us, but that's in our perspective. Yeah. And actual terms, we're just so close to that speck that there might as well be none of us. Right. There's no no real comparison. Let's take a look at this, this ancient uh, heresy, this kenosis doctrine. Mm -hmm. Kenosis means emptying. In that verse, verse 7, Christ emptied himself, made himself of nothing. The act of Christ in emptying himself of, of the form of God, taken on the form of a servant and suffering death on a cross. That's what this doctrine teaches. According to, Kenotic, to the canonic theory, the Son of God was incarnated as Jesus of Nazareth. He emptied himself of some of his divine attributes, like omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, and lived for a period of, on earth within the limitations of human existence. Now, how do you get to this doctrine is that Christ had to give up attributes of the divine nature and I, we did some bible study at one point and i said okay um what what are essential divine attributes and what did christ have to, able to shed and still maintain his <laughs> divinity well long story short all the attributes divine attributes are essential yeah you can't get of a sink yes if they were unessential god wouldn't have it, wouldn't have it right <laughs> like god said okay well i'll get rid of uh, omniscience i won't know everything well if there's one thing in the universe that God does not know, someone hiding behind the planet, Jupiter, you know, right. and, and he's whispering a secret in somebody else's ear, and God doesn't know that, he doesn't have omniscience. Yeah. And but, he's no longer God. Right. Honestly. If yeah. there's one, what somebody said, one maverick molecule in the universe running around, then there's no God. Yeah, it's like R.C. Sproul mentioned that. If you could hide from God in some sort of area, imagine what that area would be like. It'd be a godless place, which yeah. doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. When I was exactly. a kid, it was under the bed. I, I literally <laughs> tried to hide from God under the bed. Really? That's right. Yeah. I'd get under there and say, God can't see me. But then I go, I think he can. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of that scene of the cat in the hat. And they're playing hide and go seek with the cat. Right. And they're under the bed and they're hiding. And all of a sudden, the cat pops up behind him under the bed. Who are we hiding from? Yeah. Yeah. The cat's already there, isn't he? <laughs> you think you're hiding from the cat and he's already there with you, hiding with you. We have that that's on VHS. Kind of, that's a hilarious <laughs> movie. That's a hilarious scene from that movie anyway. I like the fishy in the bowl. Yeah. Well, what does Jesus give up, as far as divine attributes go, to become flesh? Well, the correct answer, so you don't become a heretic tonight, right. is he didn't give up any. He didn't give up any divine, any divine attribute. Right. That's true. Now, That's the question true. is, how could he be um, omnipresent 
everywhere at all times and be in the confines of a body of a Palestinian Jew in the first century. Mm. And here's, here's the way I reconcile this, is that the omniscience of God is not, uh, is not in the sense of him being physical in all places, right. but, but that his knowledge is such that he knows what's happening in all places at all times. Yeah. And that's true of Christ. He knew what's happening in all places at all times. He had all power. He even says, I could command 10,000 legions of angels to get me off this cross. He had omnipotence. Right. Um, he knew all things. He could knew, knew it was in the hearts of those around him. When he asked questions in his earthly ministry, wasn't he know anything right. because he knew the hearts of his accusers? He just could breathe himself off that cross or snap himself off that cross. He didn't even need angels, did he? Yeah. But as a point, as a point of showing this, you know, one angel could defeat a legion of Roman armies, and what ten thousand legions of angels could do defeat the whole Roman Empire. But he didn't even need that. Okay. So while Christ retains all those essential divine attributes. He chooses not to exercise them. He doesn't play that card, as ah. some would say. That's not a good example. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe maybe you're playing Pokemon with your friend. Yeah, you, that's, you, that's what it is. You've got a Pokemon that can beat the next guy's Pokemon, but you're going to hold off because you don't want to use that one in the first yeah. round. How a Pokemon works. I don't know how that, that works. That is how it that's works. That's how it works. So I'm going to hold this one back because I don't need to go, come too heavy with that. Well, yeah. he, he could have come heavy. Save it. He's going to hold it back, right? Mm -hmm. he, he, there's glimpses of him having all these attributes oh yeah the omnipotence he says to uh to andrew right i saw when you when you're under the tree in, the, in right, john chapter one right. i saw you under the tree right. means that christ already knows what's happening in all places if he taps into that but i think how it worked out practical and this is me speculating here is he enters human state chooses not to retain the, the privilege of those things maybe in like a hypnotic trance blocks those things right. So that while he's on earth, he doesn't access those all the time. Right. They haven't left him. Right. But he's not using them. He still has them. He doesn't play the card. Right. He holds it back where the case would be. This, the work of salvation. I like this next verse here, Cameron. Next two verses. Philippians 2, 12 through 13. Uh, I'll just give it to you. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for God, for it is God who works to your will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. All right. So Paul says to work out your salvation as God works it in you. Right. So we're working out what God's working in. Right. Let's answer the question. Who does the work of salvation? G-O-D. God does the work of it in us. Mm -hmm. But we work it out. Right. Which means what, Jerry? Uh, working it out. This process of sanctification, mm -hmm. which is definitely a work of the Spirit of God, but it's in conjunction with our obedience. We have to obey. Uh, some of what God was working out of them was through suffering, working yep. out that salvation, affirming their salvation. So, yeah, put on your leotards, your exercise clothes, right, and get ready to work out. Yeah, because we're called to work out. Go to church, pray, read your Bible. <laughs> That's right. We're called to be spiritually fit, and that's how you work out. Because yeah, right. God's working in you. Right. Let's take a look at a character we're not real familiar with, except we see in the scriptures here. Uh, Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus. Brother, soldier, messenger, and friend. Brother, mm. soldier, messenger, and friend. Oh, Remember? no. <laughs> Epaphroditus. Yep. Philippians 2, 25-30. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus. <laughs> A pet thread. That's good. You're a guy. Okay. He's not offended at all. <laughs> <laughs> EPAP is what we call him. EPAP for <laughs> Can we just call him EPAP? Sure. EPAP. Okay. Palpatine. EPAP. My brother, co worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of all my needs. Mm -hmm. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because, of you, because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on, and not on him, but also on me. To, okay, cut that out. To spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help yourselves could not give me. Ah. Epaphroditus was with him, with, with Paul, and almost died. Right. Ooh. 
And for Paul's sake, he's like, if you, I'm, I'm glad that he didn't die. Yeah, it's better for him to go with Christ, I know. <laughs> but, but it's much better if he stays here for me and helps me out. That's have, right. Have you ever heard of the top four diners? Just from Just this. Just this one. <laughs> Never met another. Well, let's roll well, back no, here. Have you ever heard of him? What do we know about him? What are some things we know about this he, guy? He journeyed with Paul and almost died from an illness. Yep. He's his brother in the faith. Right. He's a co-worker. Co-worker. Fellow soldiers, soldier, messenger, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, messenger of the Lord. Messenger. Is messenger of divine. Uh, maybe a letter carrier, uh, sending oh, back okay. and forth. That yeah, sort I of mean, thing. they sent stuff with him to help Paul. So he's they, a mule. Yep, mule. He's also like a nursemaid. I guess you right. said take care of Paul. Paul has declining physical. This is Paul's fourth prison epistle. Right. He's writing this from prison, so he needs people to come in and provide him medical care, nurse aid. Otherwise, he's thing. not going to get anything to eat or anything else. So. It's like a prison in Latin America, right? Where if you don't. If you don't bring your food, you just don't eat. Yeah. How many times was Paul stoned in his life? He mentions it in his in uh, in Galatians, right? Oh yeah, he says, "I have done all this and all this." And he goes stoned on. and shipwrecked yeah. and yeah. beaten and betrayed. I don't know for sure. That's crazy. But but more than more than a few. Okay, so he was a nurse care. Also, we also know this about him. He was like, he almost died himself. Right. Maybe he had malaria, right? Very common among this that, among that time and that part of the world. Maybe he had an ailment like that, and maybe he was so sick that he almost died. And again, we don't think of dying of malaria nowadays, but when you travel to parts of the world where there is malaria, you, you vaccinate yourself, you prevent that from happening. And then also he's sent back to the church. Uh, he's the letter carrier. He's sent back to this church. Uh, the news is made is made made known, but he's he's come through it. This guy's something else because he risked his life helping Paul. And it says a lot about the guy. It says a lot about, you know, Christianity. That's right. He's a true believer. Let's move on and look at the, the credentials of Paul. The mm -hmm. credentials of Paul. Philippians 3, 4 through 6. If someone else thinks they have the reasons to put in confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the, of the tribe of Benjamin, and the Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Mm. Gotcha. So what do you know about Paul from this very brief uh, resume? Definitely a strong, a strong Christian. Before his conversion to Christianity, what do you know about Paul? He was oh. a, definitely a strong Jew. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a Hebrew of Hebrews. He came from the tribe of Je Benjamin. He was circumcised the eighth. Well, I could brag about that. Yeah, I he had nothing to do that days old. I, I took. Uh, he was a strong Christian from confidence and I have more but he was confidence in the flesh yeah. right yeah his earthly resume yeah. before his conversion not a right. spiritual boast but his fleshly boast yeah he could out boast them all he had done more for God than any of them had had he's just listing some things even beginning when he was only eight days old even beginning right. before that before he was even born he was born in the tribe of right. Benjamin and he, he had a resume yeah. but he goes on and I think as as the as the credentials are listed here did they get more impressive about the law Pharisee, mm. persecute the church. Nobody more fire for my faith than me. Based on righteousness, based on the law, faultless, mm -mm -mm. priceless. It's like that credit card commercial. Yeah, <laughs> priceless. Yeah. If you looked up, you know, what is the perfect? Who is the perfect Jew? Or what does the perfect Jew look like under the old covenant? You open the book up, there be a picture of Paul. Yep. Poster child for Judaism. Po poster child. That's it. Going so far as to actually kill Christians, thinking he was doing the right thing. Right, right. In fact, Jesus says there come a day, when he said to the apostles, there come a time when people who kill you think you're doing, they're doing the right thing. He's talking about Saul of Tarsus. Right. Who th thank God, we can thank God for this, that he was converted and he started right. doing the actual right thing. Right. Okay. Move on to the rejoice, the idea of rejoicing. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends to all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. right. What would make the Christian believer rejoice? What are some things that could make us rejoice? Gosh, I, I just keep thinking about, you know, everything that we've looked at here and how much of what we've looked at it had to do with suffering. Mm. And here Paul says, hey, 
Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll tell you one more time. <laughs> right. Rejoice. They needed to hear this. They right. needed to hear. Cheer up. Prayer. Hang in there. Prayer and thanksgiving. Yeah, we should offer prayer and thanksgiving to God for I sure. I think attending church. That could be a reason to rejoice. So much. There Reading is so the much to rejoice. Reading the Bible. Yeah, we rejoice. We have salvation is a reason to rejoice. Right. Sing, singing a church song, like yeah. hymns. Yeah, that's the way we could express rejoicing, right? Let's do those kind of means. I think that, you know, you can go down, you know, count your many blessings, name them one by one. Certainly, we could go down a long list of things that, you know, wake up in the morning and to feel okay, uh, to know that you've got clothes to wear, bed to sleep in, a family to love you. Yeah, all these things. So much to be thankful for. But, you know, when, when the bottom drops out of our world, we've got still have the most important thing to be thankful for. Yeah. And that's our relationship to God. Because uh, everything you mentioned to start off with can be taken from you. Right. Your, your, your health, your right. home, your stuff, even your mind. Right. Your sound mind. Yes. <laughs> but the one thing Amen. you cannot be take, take away from Jerry should be the foundation of his rejoicing. Yeah. And it's in salvation provided by Christ. That's yeah. the one thing that cannot be taken from Jerry that is the is the is the bedrock of all his rejoicing. Amen. If you get him think I can't think of any reason to be happy. <laughs> well if you're a Christian you have at least one reason to be yeah. happy. Maybe you maybe you're your kids grow up and leave you, and your wife leaves you, and your dog leaves you. <laughs> and you write a country song. <laughs> <laughs> it's a country song. Everything's repoed in your life. If you're, if you, if you are literally a Christian, if that's the ground for your, you know, if you're if you're a Christian, that is the ground for your rejoicing. And and that Paul mentions that all throughout Philippians, especially that if the worst thing that happened to me is to die, which is the best thing that happened to me. Yeah. It's gay. Contentment is where we don't like to throw around too much because what's that? Know, right? Because Madison Square Avenue marketing says never be content. Always do the next thing. Always want what your neighbor has and seek to conquer and get those things. Right. Well, there's nothing wrong with stuff. It's the coveting of stuff becomes a, becomes a problem. Right. Now Paul is going to say here what what is his ground for contentment? Philippians four ten through thirteen. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for what I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. Mm. For I have, not for what I have. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I learned the secret of being content in any and every, of being content in any and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. Right, we'll stop just for a second here. This is the exact opposite doctrine as the prosperity gospel. Yep. Which teaches be discontent with what you have and ask God to give you more. You're a child of God. You got the right to demand things. Money get in my bank. New car get in my driveway. They really preach a, a contrary message than Paul because Paul said he didn't deny having periods of being well fed, but he said he's been there, but he's been hungry too. He didn't deny having plenty, but he also said he's he's been in want. Right. And and the sick and Paul's not saying if you in want get plenty, if you're hungry get fed. He's saying he's found contentment. So what's the secret of being content in any and every situation? God, salvation. Yeah, that's the ground, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The Christians in China who are in internment camps and are being imprisoned, can rejoice, and maybe more so than we do. Right. And it's not because of circumstances, it's because their, ground, their salvation is grounded in the one who would never leave them nor forsake them. I can do all this through him who gives me the strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Uh, at Continent, we, the, our music teacher, we learned to sing that verse. Don't, don't ask because I'm not going to sing it. But, uh, what has been so helpful for me, and for years I didn't, I didn't see it, and it was there all along, is that Paul said he had learned this, ah. that he wasn't reborn again with this understanding, <laughs> but through his plenty and, and lack thereof, Paul had learned mm -hmm. to rely on Christ. Don't depend on the plenty, because it's going to disappear. Mm -hmm. He wasn't hatched from an egg knowing this stuff. <laughs> right. he, yeah. he had to learn it, and he had learned right. it through hard knocks, right? right? It was school hard knocks, yeah, life experiences. A lot of Christians out there listening will be listening that, that are learning it. You know, and we're all learning it to a degree, but sometimes there's it's the first time you're learning it, and it can be very, very faith shaking when you are learning it. Yeah, your hope is not that God gives you a new car, though you might need that, or that God gives you 
You're actually cancer free at the next report. Your hope mm. ought to be in Christ and Christ alone. Amen. Amen. And we're going to close out with the last few slides here. The church that stood with Paul. Mm. The church that stood with Paul. Philippi? You got it. <laughs> Philippians 4, 15 through 16. A final thank you. <laughs> Moreover, as you Philipp Philippians know, I was thinking of Philippi. In the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once whenever I was in need. All right. Now, what do we know about the church in Philippi? We're going to close this out. Big blanket question going all the way back. We've gone through 57 slides. What do you know about the church of Philippi? They were a good church, and they enjoyed Paul a right. lot. One of the few, just one of the few to stick with him all the way through it. At least twice gave him financial aid. Well, we can assume aid. what I said. We can assume. Yep. Yeah. That's a good assumption because, like you said, they, you know they they helped Paul out more than one time. Mm -hmm. he, they were there for Paul. A giving church, a loving church, right. and the first church on European soil. Amen. <laughs> and if it wasn't for the Church of Philippi, there'd be no church in far western Europe. There'd be no church in the United States today. If you, you, can you can trace church history all the way in Europe from the Church of Philippi westward. The gospel goes west. Uh, and, and then eventually, in the 15th century, crossing the Atlantic Ocean and founding roots in the New World here. Right. And we can go trace our ancestors all the way back to some stepping off the Mayflower or some somehow finding con conversion through the European, the church right. in European soil. Amen. Now, that's, that would be true if, if you're from uh, Asian descent and you, you came over from the Asian, you may, the gospel, the Church of Philippi was it your ancestry. Right. But because the gospel goes all across the continents in the first 10 years of Christianity, it's, it's probably about every continent uh, known to man except for maybe the New World. Well, appreciate you guys joining us tonight. Thank you for sticking this out. We've come to an, a yet an, an end of another uh, end of another night of study. Right. We've got a few more. How many we got left here, Brother Jerry? Oh, my goodness. Let's turn the page. Uh, on the spot. We've got Colossians, Philemon, Titus, and 1st and 2nd Timothy. All right. Mm -hmm. So we've got five more. Five more to go. And I'm, I'm pushing hard through my next study, which is an eschatology study. Right. And I'll get those books out to you guys. Uh, hopefully, I'll get this wrapped up next, next couple of weeks to so get a chance to look at this a week or two. It's going to be a 50-parter, which means it's going to be a solid year of eschatology. All right. <laughs> You'll be burned out of, uh, but but eschatology, the study of last things, really parter. really encompasses a lot. Oh, it does. It's, it's, it's not just... It's not just the rapture. <laughs> right, or the millennial views. It's of heaven, of hell, the right. afterlife. I touch upon everything eschatology, all of Jesus' sayings, Paul's teachings. If you're interested in this sort of thing, be a 50 parter. We'll see where this goes. I'm curious, when do you have time to type all this? Yeah, uh, when you're in bed. <laughs> <laughs> or at various times. I just do it. Any anything any prayer concerns before we close out tonight, guys? Sue Stouffer. Keep Sue in prayer. She's not in very good health. Okay, we'll keep my Aunt Sue in prayer. There's prayer concerns you mentioned. I have them at work. I don't have them here. So there's some concerns mentioned Sunday at church, and I can't recall those. Any concerns mentioned through that? Uh, let's see. Wilma can't see me. I'm sorry about that. Oh, I need oh to lean that in is more. a camera there. I got you. Right. That was the yeah, unknown commentator. Well, if, if you if, where you are right now, it's fine, camera. It's okay. good. Yeah, I'm all right now. And we've got oh. a lady in church, uh, from church. Who was in the hospital, uh, Laura Gamblin, and she's been in, in the hospital for almost uh, two months. Oh. And she's really needing prayer. So Miss Gamblin, you can keep her in prayer. Anything else we close out tonight? It's neat watching the the delay oh. here. You're already seated, and it shows you getting seated. Yeah, it's like, Jeremy Harris, we pray for Cecily and their. Yeah, children. they should have found out yesterday. The the boy or girl? Ooh, we're supposed ooh. to find out yesterday, so maybe we'll find out here soon. When the word gets out, we'll find, we'll find out. If there's nothing else, we'll close out in prayer. Thank you guys for sticking this out. It's about an hour. I know we lost oh. some of those slides at the beginning, but Aaron, here we go. Her daughter and her friend in their car wreck, or car, no, they got sick. Yeah, there was two that were sick, and there was a baby that was born. Taking, Maybe that was um, uh, Jerry and Sherry, her daughter and her friend. Oh, yeah, Jer Sherry Corbin's daughter was in Panama City with food poisoning and her friend, and they were sick no. in a hotel room somewhere. That's bad. 
A lot of things. Easter, Easter we will know. I guess, baby. Oh, Easter we will know. Uh, we might know Sunday. We might know this. I think it's, we can know. Be cool if it did a, a baby reveal with an Easter egg. <laughs> Maybe they plan cool. to do that. I don't know. We're going to have a bunny. Ideas. <laughs> well, Jerry, we close us out yep. in prayer. Let's pray, everybody. Father, I thank you so much for our time uh, together studying your word. And I thank you for these guys here next to me. And I appreciate, Lord, the time we can fellowship together and learn and grow in our faith. And Father, we pray for our churches and, and for the folks who are listening and who will listen and for the many needs that uh, we have mentioned tonight. God, have mercy on this world and, and help your church to be faithful to you. And bless this home in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. See you Sunday morning services, 11 o'clock uh, at Pleasant View Baptist or Salem Baptist. We do broadcast hours on tape delay, uh, but Sunday school should be live. So tune in, watch the broadcast. I'm enjoying your study in theology, man. It's good oh, stuff. Man, it's, is good. it's hard getting it together because I'm so thick. Well, you go as long as you need to. All right. See you guys next Wednesday night, Lord willing, 6 o'clock. We'll be in the next, next letter down the list, which will be Colossians. God bless you guys. Take care.